So good morning, friends. You're all my participants of the performance management program. And I have with you a thought leader in the profession and a subject matter expert. And that is Mr. Yogi Sriram. Uh, Yogi is a consultant to and to the CEO and managing director of Lassen and Tudro. And he's also part of the group Human Resources. And he has spent a large chunk of his life and career in, uh, in Lassen and Tudro, what is now called LNT. He's been advisor, full-time advisor to the CEO, and he's been the group uh, CHRO. And, and he's one of the HR legends uh, in India. And uh, he's been covered in many of the books, uh, et cetera, also. So after his uh, moving to part-time engagement with l and Sriram's goal is now to contribute to industry as a consultant with his expertise in leading HR for over four decades for these large companies. And more particularly, after leading HR function of India's most successful and large engineering and construction conglomerate, last year. At LNT, now coming closer to our heart, he's contributed by conceptualizing and implementing a performance management system called FAIR, which is the framework for appraisals, increments, and rewards. Developing a high potential program. Uh, of leadership development with over 20,000 assessments of leaders in two decades and several first of its kind HR policies, particularly in leadership development and talent management. So Yogi, uh, our participants are all attendees of my very popular performance management program. And, uh, you know, we are looking at how we can manage performance by design and a look into the future of performance management systems. So a few years ago, we do know that many companies had, had too much of disillusionment with the PMS. And there was a bell curve and forced normalization. And many leading companies actually did away with the performance management system as we know it. They adopted an only KPI related approach. So exactly numerical targets and rewarded performance with numerical achievement on numerical targets. And that was all that was measured and assessed. Individual developed needs were kind of separately taken care of in something called a coaching conversation, which happened and sometimes didn't happen or happened in a very casual manner or not in a very clear cut manner. The system never even captured what a coaching conversation was or what any development needs of the person were. And uh, for the last five or 10 years, we've been working like this in many large organizations while others continue with a traditional form of PMS. So this worked for a while, but we find that managers tend to use the target rating system to drive only numbers and professional development, leadership, qualities, teamwork, competencies all take a backseat. They get neglected and the company's culture also often suffers. Uh, we see increasing alienation and things like quiet resignations, and attrition at record levels, and companies are struggling to hire new people all the time in a firefighting mode without being able to appropriately plan for their leadership development. So Yogi, as a thought leader in the world of HR and PMS in particular, what do you see as the next step in the evolution of the PMS? How can it actually contribute positively to culture and leadership development? Yes, please. Sure. Anita, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this conversation. It's a it's a subject which is both intrigue, intriguing, enigmatic, uh, perplexing, and for HR folks, something that they've been struggling with for years. The concept of performance appraisal started with something called merit rating. And merit rating was based on something which was very rudimentary, the assembly line and how many widgets one, one produced and so on. And it's graduated now to a different level. Uh, to answer your question, uh, I think not only in the future, but here and now, what is very important in terms of a company's culture is fairness and trust. An employee will, of course, be attracted to a company for the compensation, but will stay only if he or she feels that he or she is being treated with fairness and is able to work with people and processes which are credible. 
therefore performance appraisal is a great opportunity to send a message that we are a fair company you see you can't dole out increments and rewards without some basis there has to be some basis and doing it in a total egalitarian manner public sector organization a maharatna or a navratna or whatever or a mini ratna but in a private sector organization to do that uh, would send a message to those who want to shine ahead of others who are competitive that this is a egalitarian kind of an organization whatever you do you'll be treated like the others so therefore there has to be some policy or some system in order to differentiate between one and the other and this is a great opportunity to actually convert an instrument or a process which actually generates fear frankly speaking when you talk about differentiation and when you talk about ranking people of you know putting them in different brackets it reminds not only youngsters but people who are in gen x and also the older people that this is something like a school report card you know how the school report card one used to think of especially if you weren't the brightest of students <laughs> parents would pull the ear saying again in hindi you got only this much how can you do that <laughs> so to convert this entire process from something that instills fear to something which is a part of a culture where you're talking about lifelong learning yeah. where you're looking at the boss and the people who are responsible for assessing a behavior for example in 180 degrees 270 and 360 which is not just the boss but also the people around you who uh, you know give you feedback if it's treated and uh, if it becomes a part of the culture like a corporate university as a part of a corporate university so here are genuine people who are not out to get you or who are also not going to play scratch my back and i'll scratch your back which is unfair i give you a good rating you give me a good rating that's that's actually not at all fair or it's actually cheating in a way but if they are authentic and if they are uh, genuine about their feedback it can be an immensely powerful way of development therefore uh, the performance conversation part in a performance appraisal is extremely important and valuable you asked me about what is going to happen in the future i think you asked me about what i think is going to happen yeah well there are some pain points in performance management systems there are also points that people have not been able to crack so far yeah for example if i am getting out of a target of let's say rupees 1 lakh and 50000 i'm getting 1 lakh yes per year as a performance reward or a variable pay reward i must know the basis and typically this is tied to i'm not talking about long term incentives and we are wandering now into rewards but we need to talk about rewards because the reward rating linkage in performance appraisal is extremely important i repeat the reward rating linkage it has to be authentic so i must know why have i got only 1 lakh when my target was 1 lakh 50000 and i have performed very well so then comes the effort of the team the effort of the company or the performance of the company which has resulted in a particular result now if i have to have line of sight with the performance of the entire company it is impossible with traditional legacy systems it is possible with digital systems it is possible with ai subject to of course the legal guidelines as per company law you can't be uh, absolutely to the t in terms of your profit after tax and so on because there are some restrictions the books have to be closed the auditors have to sign off and stuff but at the same time there's a pattern like let's say receivables uh if your receivables are going high your working capital is going high yeah. that pattern can be actually shared with the employees which is very important the other point here is it is actually quite a challenge to define what is performance it's easy to say performance management system should 
be understood by all, but even the best of financial pundits and strategy pundits have struggled to say what should be performance for this particular for this company at this particular point of time. Hmm. Is it economic value added? Is it revenues? Is it order intake? Is it profit after tax? Is it EBIT? What is it and what should it be? Because defining that and cascading that with line of sight to every individual employee is extremely important. Hmm. The other point, of course, is that performance appraisal uh, going, in the, going forward is going to be an extremely important part of employee engagement. Do tell me when I should hold back my steam for the next question, because otherwise I'll keep going. Yeah? Uh, no, no, please carry on. Um, you know, my when you were speaking about all the you know benchmarks of performance, like value add and, and contribution to sales, etc. I always say, what about leadership qualities? What about potentials? What about uh, competencies? Yeah. You know, the person might have done it in a more efficient manner, achieved his goals or exceeded his goals, and a person may have done it in a less efficient manner and achieved his goals. We need to reward the one who's done it more efficiently and taken more people along with him and contributed to the company yeah. culture. Absolutely, absolutely. But before that, I wanted to complete what I was saying in the previous point, okay. which is about employee engagement. Yes. Employee engagement is a two-year ritual or a one-year ritual in many companies. And it takes a long cycle time for people to score off check boxes and stuff. I think AI will aid employee engagement and performance management to the extent of being real time. You will have a net promoter score, which is almost virtual all the time. People can see it. They can tell you about how the conversation went with the boss and so on. So that's extremely important. In terms of the point you made about coaching, look, that we all know that there are two dimensions to this entire human development yes. challenge. One is potential development, the other is performance development. And when you talk about potential development, people, you know, they rely on things like Hogan's 11 derailers, or they look at 16 PF, or they look at MBTI, or they look at uh, you know stuff like inclusion, control, and affection in Firo B. That is just not enough. I think the perception of performance and uh, what is the performance being rated by your peers, by your boss, by your internal customers, even your subordinates is extremely important. And to process these are very important. Now I want to say something which I think is critical where AI can be used yes. and where digitization can be used. You know, Anita, what happens in actual real life is that people, let's say we're talking about communication skills, okay, verbal communication skills yes. as one of the points that need to be rated. And you do, you do a 270, you ask about nine people who interact with this person about is the verbal communication clear? Is it concise? Uh, is it timely, et cetera, et cetera. And let's say there's a rating scale of one to five. So one person gives five, the other person gives four, another person gives three, somebody else gives four and a half, so on and so forth. Typically in performance management systems, they take the average of all this and they say, this is your score. But I think that's not enough. What is very important is to take the standard deviation because consistency of behavior, whether it is your boss or whether it's your subordinate or whether it's your customer is very important. And your perception in your mind that this person is in power and therefore I should say Haji and the other person I should be not so polite with in my email and so on is something which needs to be considered. Therefore, standard deviation is very important. Yes. The other point is, uh, by the way, in performance management systems that in, in the future, maybe they're already doing it right now. It's not necessarily to only depend on performance conversations. You can analyze the email that a person is getting and sending. You can anal analyze the calendar entries, all this without getting too intrusive, okay? And being very transparent. For example, if there's a person who tends to write email in a very... Uh, brusque manner or he's a dog he or she is a doctor no uh, which many hr people are sometimes accused of 
you know, saying, no, it's not possible, it's as per policy, and they just shut the person off. So the person will get a feedback that you can say no, but say it in a way where the other person first understands why you're saying no. So these are very important facts that uh, can be supported virtually by AI and by performance management systems, which are digitally enabled. And I think the future belongs there yes. because we are not going to be able to run away from the so-called normal distribution curve. Okay, in some companies, it may be more gentle. In some companies, it may be more drastic. Uh, but you can't be totally egalitarian. After all, your shareholder, when he or she buys a share, is discerning whether he or she buys share of a company X or company Y based on the expectation, you know. Uh, there is no sympathy or no emotion there. I'm not saying it should be so heartless when it comes to your ratings uh, and you dump people relentlessly. But you need to differentiate between one person and the other because it's a very competitive world. Yes, it is. So that's great. You've covered a wide range of issues and you've talked about so many things and um, including, you know, the numerical assessments, the competency-based assessments, the potential assessments, the qualitative ones like business communication skills as an example, and all the range of issues that come up. And yet we cannot wish away a management, uh, a performance management system and we need to look at the values with which it's implemented and try to build on those values of trust and communication and uh, and measure and, and replace fear as a part of the you know system as something which is welcome because the performance conversation should become an extension of corporate of a corporate university it's my opportunity to learn it's an opportunity to learn a performance review it's, it's, yeah it's actually enhancing my cv because exactly. someone's taking the trouble to sit me down is saying that, hey, I'm going to tell you about what I think you can do better in this situation yes. and is actually producing evidence So and says, I'll help you and I'll repeat this the next time I see you do it. True. So that is extremely valuable. Very true. And uh, getting that feedback from people who are around you is a very, very important part of our own learning and growth. There's okay. also a point on biases, which I will cover later once uh, you know you exhaust your other questions. Yes. My next question to you is more about, you know, uh, the young generation, the Gen Z and the Gen Alpha, which is in the pipeline <laughs> into the system. That's where the buy-in is missing. And they just cannot understand or comprehend. And maybe, maybe the leaders have failed to communicate or it's a generational thing as to why uh, they need to have a performance appraisal and why they need to have a performance review discussion and why does their reward have to be based on on so many factors and why is there something like a bell curve and normalization. So what do you have to say about uh, how to bring the buy-in from the employees, the younger set of employees particularly? Okay. Here, uh, I want to dive into uh, the work of Eric Erickson, who talks about eight stages of life. And he talks about these stages being epigenetic, which means that you move from one stage to another, unlike the Maslow's theory where you can jump from stage one to stage five. So these are dependent on the ages that you go through in life, adulthood and so on. You talk specifically about the younger generation, that's why I'm talking also about them. Yes. Uh, there is a particular stage, particularly when younger people are between, let's say, 15 and 25. These ages can differ depending on what culture we're talking about. But typically, let's say 15 to 25 or 12 to 25. Uh, when they're going through a search for a sense of identity, who am I? It's very important. Which is, And the next question for me is, who am I and what is my purpose in life? And uh, I want you to think about two circles which are intersecting with each other. One circle is about the choices I have. And the other circle is about the commitment I have to these choices I fix, or the choices I can see. You know? yes. 
Now, when I grew up, and perhaps when you grew up, the size of that circle of choices was, I'm just drawing it in the air. Limited. Today, it is massive, massive. So the first task of any manager, supervisor, who is about 10 years older to a youngster, is to say, I empathize with this person because it's a very confusing world. And I want to sit with this person to identify what are the choices I can make in life. Do I want to specialize in Java? Do I want to specialize in Python? Do I want to go abroad? Do I want to sit here? Do I want to do an MBA? Do I want to do this? Do I want to get job rotated every three years? Do I want to specialize in something narrow? There's a lot of questions the youngsters have. So it's very, very important for managers, leaders to have the patience and not, of course, depend upon Mere Zamane Me Me Karta Tha. It's a new Zamana. Yes. Mere Zamana choices are all now, you know, passe. Yes. And try to work with the person a sense of what would you like to do most, though it can take many sessions to do that. I think the younger person would feel tremendously uh, grateful to the uh, manager or the boss. The other point is when we talk about uh, younger people being coached through the performance management system, and you talked about quiet quitting and you talked about loud quitting is also there, by the way. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. And there is, you know, there is apple polishing, maybe stargazing also. I don't know what all there is. We can invent words even during this this conversation. There's so many ways to disengage with your work. Absolutely. So I want to remember with you the work of a person called Solomon Ash, 1952. What he did was that he had batches of 10 walking into a room, of the, which there were nine what he called as confederates. And one was an innocent person not primed in advance. <laughs> now, these nine people were told in advance that I'm going to show you a card, each of you individually, with three lines, A, B, and C. And B is always longer than A and C, but you're going to say the opposite, please. And the innocent person, he didn't say anything, no instruction. So he went from left to right, left starting with Confederate 1 and right going to Confederate 9. And 10th one the, was the innocent person. Yes. So the first person who was asked, which is the line which is the longest, he said C, whereas A, B was the longest. Yes. The next, which is the line which is longest, C. Yes. So the point I'm trying to get is 33% of the people by the time it came to the innocent guy who was not told anything, changed their mind and said, maybe everybody is right and I'm wrong. Yes. C could be long, longer than B, though my mind tells me that B is the longest. My eyes tell me that B is the longest. The point I'm trying to make is the genesis of the conformity bias started with Solomon Ash's experiments. Of course, before that, but tabled through research. And I think it's extremely important to tell you to, to discuss with youngsters that there is a tendency to get carried away that kisi ne resignation de diya to hum bhi kyon nahi hum bhi kyon nahi karte hain aise hum yes. piche kyon reh jaye yes person for ctc and so on yes so uh, i think the performance conversations are essential making people aware that we are human beings with various open to or vulnerable, not open, vulnerable to various biases, cognitive biases, which are like, you know, bandwagon bias, uh, confirmation bias, attribution bias, anchoring bias. I mean, there are 186 cognitive biases. Yes. And I've been trying to muddle around with all of them. So, <laughs> so making people aware of what are these biases, because... In the world that the younger people are going to see, the number one competency is the art and science of making a judgment when the black and the white are not there at all. You see only grays. It's so much of volatility, so much of uncertainty. You know. 
so when 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 there's only shades of gray that are available to people i need to be absolutely objective and keep my biases or at least be aware of my biases and say maybe i am i tend to be more biased towards this i'll give you a simple illustration supposing i am a teacher who is correcting assignments and there are five questions in this assignment the first question the person does brilliantly the second third and fourth and the fifth i tend to do give him or her very good marks you know it's called the halo effect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what you do is instead of taking the first second third fourth fifth together you take all the first questions amongst the 20 people in the class and compare them take all the second questions and the 20 people in the class you'll get a different result definitely so there are ways of dealing with your biases which is a part of the performance conversation which is very important so the performance conversation is the place where we talk about we discuss all the kind of limiting biases and all the kind of uh, you know growth problems all the issues that and we help the younger generation also to see things in a way which is more real and and listen please without talking down at them i mean by being by playing level field so that's where the coaching style comes in including our respective children today if you try to talk down and give them instructions nobody it doesn't work with me also it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't work with anybody yeah. i don't anyone telling me what to do and i don't uh, expect anybody else to like uh, yeah. to tell what to do so so the coaching style is that much more uh, you know uh, required when you do the feedback or the performance review discussion uh, there's a skill and there's an art to it and and we as and the managers who are watching this program who are all going to be doing performance review discussions in the next couple of months uh, they also could understand that there is an art and a skill and that's a learning journey for them as well that's one also dis i've also discovered something uh, anita that uh, there is a there is a tension between ai and ego you you will be wondering what am i talking about tension between ai and ego you know something there could be a leader who says ye ai ka system jo hai mujhe kya batayega main to sab kuch janta hu is aadmi ke bare so then the performance appraisal system goes for a 6 i think it's very important to sort this out in one's mind that hr is presenting a system after discussion with everyone which should be followed with a certain discipline and right from the top of the company right to the bottom whether it is goal setting or whether it is conversations it's all a matter of discipline and ai can help us in making us more aware of our biases do fair goal setting do fair appraisals fair ratings and so on but we must follow the rigor and be role models for all around us yes otherwise if we say you know human judgment is more important than you know all these forms and stuff and i know what is right i am not going to look at the numbers i need to coach this person because the person talks too much listens less and that's it you know unless one is able to capture the episodes the incidents play them back etc as you know in coaching it just yes. won't work yes so that's uh, that's a great point that you're making that uh, ai and ego sometimes have a <laughs> and uh, and that's uh, in fact the biggest failing of any leader yeah. is not to look at uh, evidence based and research based decision making and not to look at what the data is telling you because your ego comes in the way absolutely uh, and uh, you know acknowledging that there is a different uh, world out there so that's uh, that's an amazing insight for all the people who are watching this one uh, because all the ones who are being uh, going to be watching this are all going to be reviewers and engaging in these review discussion so uh, you have talked again and again about ai and uh, technology and so specifically what are some of the areas in which uh, you know the processes are going to get better in the coming future and by the way one statistic is that by 2025 57% of the companies will be adopting ai and largely in hr Uh, you know and, uh, and in some form or the other 
And I already I was in San Francisco with a friend of mine who was developing an AI tool specifically for performance management. I'll talk about that in a separate forum. But in your opinion, what is uh, what are some of the ways processes? Okay. AI first can... of all, AI is not new. AI was uh, first spoken about in 1956. That's true. Uh, and uh, the extent to which it is impacting HR today is rather feeble. Everybody is talking and it's at an exploratory level. But going forward, I think the role of AI in terms of uh, goal setting, especially for helping in areas such as uh, what is the individual's contribution to a team? You know, the organization structures are also getting more agile with uh, words like tribe and guild and all that being used you know about the spotify organization structure yes yes so i think the individual's contribution to the team is going to be very important to measure and that would be numerically as well in terms of traits qualities behaviors and so on uh, how the person reacts to certain situations so i think people will have to be conscious of the fact that while it may sound threatening, you are being tested all the time. Yes. And while you may not be punished for wrong behaviors because it happens to be once in a way or inadvertent and so on, you will be given the feedback thanks to machinery like AI. So AI is going to be very, very valuable in goal setting, in ratings, in performance conversations, and in also telling us about our biases and so on. Um, I think the entire struggle of stitching together the MBOs of various people in the organization to make it one cogent you know, objective or to cascade it from one cogent objective, while the uh, ERPs of the world have tried their best to do it, to do it in a more convincing manner with participation of the individuals concerned will be better enabled through AI. That's so, exactly the tool I, I witnessed myself. I had a demo of that tool yeah, yeah. a month ago in Silicon Valley. And, and you know, things like past performance, let's say if I got a particular performance feedback five years back yes. on the fact that I need to improve uh, the way I present a paper, not my communication skills, but the way I present it in terms of a logical sequence and so on. Uh, have I improved? Is it similar? Is it the same? Uh, what are the new techniques? What are the benchmarks? All this is very difficult to do with a conventional appraisal system. So AI will help and we can make, we can take small steps even by using, you know, Excel programs and a good ERP, et cetera, to go in that direction. So there's plenty of scope for uh, further evolution in the I way to so. manage performance. And, so. uh, but some fundamentals of leadership and mentoring and coaching will still remain. And uh, before we before we wind up on this question, uh, one of the most powerful things that AI has brought here and now as we speak, Anita, is uh, LXPs. LXPs are recommendatory platforms for learning and development. So. Just like in Amazon, if you type, let's say, Nikon D500 or D850 or Z8 or something, for the next 15 days, you get recommendations, but others are also saying Canon and so on. Yeah. So similarly, if you type uh, in a learning management system, which we now call LXP because it's recommendatory, uh, something like uh, risk management, yes. you know, which is a competency I want to develop in you will get lots and lots of recommendations of uh, what you should read, what you should go through, what is the content and so on, which is a very, very powerful part of the performance management system. Yes, that's, that's a wonderful input from you. So the LXP or the learning experience yeah. platforms, which are generative and you know, AI in nature, they keep generating Absolutely. Learning opportunities which you and in lines of inquiry which you are creating as a user. Correct. Yes, and that the, the starting point can be the discussions between the yeah. uh, between the manager and his team, and that can. So be there's a there's a there's a thin line between learning and development and performance management. So performance management will get extended into 
valuable learning and development which will make it a which is which may already makes it a very important uh, shall we say part of the life of an employee in the employee life cycle thank you so much uh, yogi is there a last message you want to give to uh, you know my audience of uh... Yeah, I mean, all the best. Please embrace uh, performance management systems uh, with uh, all the passion and vigor. It's something which is not just for companies and shareholders, but important for employees' development. Uh, the coaching part is something which assists you in lifelong learning. There are people interested in you and uh, spending their own voluntary time in wanting you to get better. Grab it with both hands and run. And all the best for that. Exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, and I look forward to further interactions on another forum. Sure, sure. On Thank safe you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.